to have you here, Paul. Thank you. Next is Amy Pope. Amy Pope is a special assistant to the president and senior director of transborder security and the national security staff at the White House. Um, she previously served as the director of border and interior enforcement in the same directorate and prior to joining the national security staff, she was the deputy chief of staff and counselor to the assistant attorney general of the criminal division of the justice department. Finally, we have David Maloney here, the senior advisor from the, um, senior advisor from the Privy Council in charge of the border action plan um, for implementation. Uh, David was appointed on January 3rd, 2012, and he, um, uh, he comes to the Privy Council office from the Canadian International Development Agency. We'd like to welcome our program, and Paul, take it away. Thank you very much, Andrew. And in fact, uh, it is urgent to get on. We have uh, one hour, I believe, allocated for our presentation today, and uh, all of you have to go back to uh, other demands, so I think we should begin. And Amy, I believe you are going to begin with your first presentation. Thank I will. You. Thank you so much um, to the Wilson Center um, and Ambassador Fraser for um, hosting this very important discussion. Um, uh, as a symbol of our continued cooperation and, and um, commitment to advancing each other's goals, David Maloney and I have agreed to share one presentation um, so that we are um, giving you a comprehensive view on what we are doing together at the border. Um, and, uh, and we didn't plan this, but I'd like to note that the weather we have today is a bit Canadian, and so I feel like we are really uh, showing our commitment to um, advancing each other's goals. Um, <laughs> so I'd like to start first by um, just recognizing what, we've, um, what we did back in 2011 when the President and the Prime Minister released the Beyond the Border Action Plan. It was a very ambitious, um, plan that, that encompassed several departments and agencies within the United States and within Canada. Um, and it, it laid out a series of um, 32 different objectives um, that did a number of things. Um, it's not just about um, what we're doing actually at the border, but um, figuring out ways to coordinate information so that we're really getting um, to the periphery of our, our two countries, to so look at the perimeter. And even before um, we get to the perimeter itself, kind of what information we can get um, internationally so that um, goods and people coming to our, our common perimeter border um, are, are screened in advance and, and their travel and trade facilitated. Um, we also are looking, um, at the same time we want to keep our citizens safe, we also want to make sure that we're um, um, maximizing our competitiveness and enhancing our prosperity. Um, it does no good if we're all perfectly safe, but we have no tra trade or travel. So um, recognizing that the, the second platform of our work together is, is um, facilitating trade. Um, likewise, we're really um, looking for ways to work together in, in terms of law enforcement. So knowing that there will be um, illicit goods and people and um, activity across our borders, how can we work better together um, in terms of, of uh, law enforcement cooperation? And, uh, and likewise, um, recognizing unless we have the bridges and ports and et cetera in place, um, and are coordinating on things like cybersecurity, um, none of this does us any good. So um, taking a real look at how to um, cooperate on things like criti critical infrastructure and cybersecurity. So those are the broad, broad outlines of the Beyond the Border Action Plan. And we want to give you, uh, we're approaching our third anniversary um, and, and uh, moving forward um, with an eye toward the future. Where, where should we go? How have we done? Um, get some feedback from people who are interested in following the issues. Um, and make sure you guys are aware of the work that we're doing um, and really um, sort of amplify some of the things that have been happening behind the scenes. Um, some of it, it may not be apparent if you're, maybe you're going a little bit faster at the border, but you don't know how much work went into making that happen. So making people aware of our commitment to the issue and um, the real successes that we've seen and maybe some of the challenges that we've seen. So that's the point of our conversation here today. Really thrilled that you all are here and are interested in the topic. Um, and I'll just launch right into addressing threats early. Um, so we believe we've made pretty meaningful progress um, in terms of this issue. The, the premise of it is that a threat to the United States is likewise a threat to Canada. And so um, where can we get information before um, a 
container of interest, a person of interest, um, um, other goods, et cetera, come into one of our borders? How can we share that information with one another? How can we harmonize our targeting rules? How can we share our intelligence? I mean, there are a whole range of options that we've outlined when we've looked at how we um, address threats early. And what we're seeing is that we are um, achieving real successes in terms of sharing information, um, particularly on cargo security. Uh, we have this integrated cargo security strategy. And it starts first as there's a strategy, there, there's actually a paper document, the strategy itself, that you can, you can find online. Um, and then we're implementing the strategy, and we're learning from our um, implementation. Um, so we began with implementation at Prince Rupert. And there, um, you know, we've realized where enhanced information sharing can lead to facilitation um, and where it can lead to greater information about um, um, threats to our country. Now, the threats we're learning about range from um, um, uh, CT threats and criminal and contraband threats. And we're likewise learning that um, it includes information about pests that we may not have known about before. So it's really a wide range of information and what we do with it um, is, is kind of our challenge for the future. Um, likewise, we are seeing what I think is really interesting in terms of kind of a, where we are in the United States on, on entry exit. Um, we have worked with Canada where an entry into Canada um, counts as data, exit data for the United States. And for those of you who are following the comprehensive Im immigration reform debate, you know that this has long been um, an important but elusive goal of, of our Congress and administration. And um, the success of this pilot um, can't be uh, overstated. I mean, we really are finding a tremendous amount of information um, that helps us to better, understanding, better understand um, who's coming and going. Um, and, and, and also helping us better understand, in terms of the United States, better understand um, uh, who is overstaying or who may be leaving through um, a land border. Um, it's sort of been a gap in our, in our information. People would fly in and it would appear as if they were overstaying a visa, but actually they were um, leaving and, and driving into Canada. And so it's giving us in, um, really important information about who's coming, who's going. And, and that allows us to really um, cabin um, persons of interest or threats of interest and use our resources to um, address those threats as opposed to um, um, slowing down the travel of persons who are really just involved in legitimate uh, travel or tourism. So I think that's a real um, success that we've seen to date. Um, likewise, we are sharing information on countering violent extremism. Um, and we're sharing information on, on intelligence threats and, and information. And I think um, that is, you know, that, that sounds like an easy thing to do, but it really means that how, how do we um, process information? What are we looking at? What are the Canadians looking at? How do we harmonize that in ways that um, the information is meaningful to both of us? And so um, it's been, uh, we've learned a lot about each other's governments in the process, and I think um, really to, to great effect. Um, so moving forward, we are, oh, this is 2013, some of our, before we move forward, I'll just capture some of the things we've done. Um, uh, we are doing joint country, third country assessments of, of agricultural products. So um, that is, uh, um, I think, an important um, way of harmonizing the way we see threats that, are, that may be coming in from um, places around the world. Um, but that translates into um, facilitating that trade when it comes into our countries. And so, um, again, protecting our, our citizens and our public, but, but um, facilitating trade and travel. Um, moving forward, we are looking to expand um, a number of our programs. Again, we are constantly learning from the work that we're doing and um, modifying our goals. So when we wrote the action plan in 2011, we had a um, sort of series of expectations as to how this would all play out. And I would say that in um, some, some ways we've had to adjust um, our, our objectives moving forward to accommodate those, um, the realities. Um, but I think what is important about our partnership here is that we're able to 
take the evidence and based the, based on the evidence adjust the work that we're doing and um, kind of reframe where it's appropriate um, or tweak or in some cases we've needed um, legislation or other agreements MOUs so so really learning from those past experiences <coughs> and that that will play out as we move forward with our integrated cargo security strategy um, we're next moving into Newark and so um, we'll take some of the lessons learned from Rupert in Montreal and, and apply that when we move into Newark. Um, we've had, um, I think, tremendous success with things like baggage screening, which, you know, if, you, if your baggage is moving and, and you're not slowed down, it's not a big deal. Um, but the amount of time that travelers are going to save, um, because they're, we've, we've now agreed to sort of harmonized baggage screening standards, and so um, your baggage coming in does not need to be um, rescreen that kind of thing is really um, significant likewise with things with the growth of nexus which is this goes but both to threat to facilitation as well as to addressing threats early it's again knowing who are our legitimate travelers who are our legitimate traders and then we can concentrate we can jointly concentrate our resources on the the biggest threats so we've seen a tremendous increase in nexus just in this past year 50 percent increase um, and so uh, that's really exciting for, for us, um, for those of us who are looking at, at border trade and travel. Um, and something that we're thinking about kind of moving forward um, more globally with our colleagues in Mexico. I mean, how do we build on these, these lessons on the tremendous success that we've ha had with Canada um, in terms of addressing threats early and then thereby really allowing for the facilitation of trade and travel? So I think that's actually um, a good segue um, into into uh, David's presentation. If we don't, if you don't mind me lingering on this slide for just a moment, I don't like to read slides, but I think this is really a good news story. The benefits that we're seeing by addressing threats early is that we are reducing the time and costs for just regular travelers um, and and persons who are are trading in our two countries. We are reducing immigration fraud, um, which matters a lot for. Um, for those of us who are working on immigration reform, um, and allowing for the exchange of information on, on persons who may not be complying with our information laws, or with our immigration laws. And then finally, this one is um, matters a lot to us, a fewer misconnections, because your, your baggage is being screened um, because we've been able to agree on, on um, harmonized standards and equipment. So, you know, little things that um, may not be um, that may not make the headlines of the New York Times, but make a real meaningful difference to the public, and um, that's why we're doing what we're doing. So I'm gonna move it to uh, my colleague, David. Thank you very much, uh, Amy, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, um, I'll uh, echo Amy's thanks as well to the Center for, um, for hosting, uh, hosting us and hosting this event, uh, having us back um, in, uh, in my case, and um, also say thank you to Amy. This is the first time we've shared uh, a presentation uh, together, but uh, as she said, uh, um, the two, our two governments, many parts of our two governments have been working very closely together now. Um, in next year is the, three, is the third anniversary of uh, the President Prime Minister uh, putting, out, uh, putting out this uh, vision, perimeter security and economic uh, competitiveness, and certainly um, from the Privy Council office, which is kind of our equivalent to the Executive Office of the President, and uh, Amy and her team, Patty Cogswell, uh, prior to uh, Amy, we've had a very close and, and we think very productive um, cooperative approach to overseeing um, the implementation of this action plan. So as, as Amy, Amy set out, we have a plan here with four pillars. Um, and the second of the pillars, as you see here, tr trade facilitation, economic growth and jobs. Um, the first point I want to make is just to underline that a key part of the, uh, of the strategic approach here in terms of thinning, if you like, the land border, the shared border between our two countries, a key part of the strategic approach here is to make sure we're taking that perimeter approach to addressing threats so that we have, we build confidence between our two governments, between our border agencies, between our countries, that those threats that come from beyond our shores 
um, are going to be adequately um, addressed, picked up, mitigated before coming into that shared land border. Hence, we don't, we don't need to have the same level of, of, uh, of concern about, about risk targeting and, and mitigation. However, we need to do more than that to facilitate um, legitimate travel, legitimate trade um, between, our, between our two countries because of the importance to our societies, to individuals, but also to our economies where we have integrated supply chains that are the way of the, way of the, uh, of the economic world these days. So, the way, as you've seen, the way we've constructed these slides is just to remind you what we did accomplish in 2012, and that's what's up here first. So, as Amy mentioned, um, we took a number of steps to, to try and make our, our trusted traveler program, Nexus, more attractive. So, we enhance benefits in terms of, of uh, providing, providing uh, more access at the land border through dedicated lanes and so on but also attracting people to, to join up to the program by uh, giving you extra access to um, privileged screening lanes in airports so that you're not spending time in lines on the way out um, and as well uh, not spending the same amount of time um, on lines coming back in. We're also, of course, deeply aware that a lot of the travel in airports, um, particularly cross-border, is business travelers. And so we have had um, um, many, many discussions with, uh, with business groups, individual business travelers, in terms of some of, some of the difficulties that, uh, that people have encountered. And so there were a number of commitments made in the action plan. We started out in 2012 with further consultations with business groups and business, business uh, people just to make sure we really understood the source of, the source of those. We also, though, and when we look at trade, we also wanted to um, see what we could do to go further in terms of what we call trusted traders. Um, so f businesses that frequently are sending not just people, but shipments of cargo back and forth across the border. So each of our countries has, um, in Canada, we refer to tier one and tier two uh, types of trusted trader programs. And so in the, U the U.S. has CTPAT. Um, uh, we, we have CSA, uh, we have a variety of kind of, there's a, an alphabet soup of these programs between our two countries. We wanted to make sure that we could learn lessons um, and to the extent we could align those programs, uh, take the best of each program, bring them to the, bring them to the other side. So we started, we started uh, some, some pilots. Um, so we have a pilot, we have a pilot that, we, that we launched in 2012. Um, to start bringing some extra benefits to the individual, individual uh, 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 program members. So PIP and CTPAT mutual recognition, that means that if you're, you could actually apply for one program, you apply once for both programs, for example, between the two countries. And then we've, we've, uh, we've been talking to, to uh, specialized business groups in terms of sorting out how could we do better? How could we bring those mutual benefits and learn? Um, so as we as we roll forward to make sure I get this the right way. There we go. So we rolled forward to last year. What was in the implement? What's covered in the implementation report that we put out about a month ago? Um, as Amy mentioned again, we have Nexus membership. Um, people have responded to the incentives. We're up about 50 percent. Um, we're now heading towards uh, we're heading towards a million members. Um, I would think during the course of uh, during the course of this year, that's up from 600,000. At the time of, of the time of the action plan, um, so it's still a relatively small number. There's lots of headroom given the um, the populations in our countries. Um, we also we also moved to um, look more towards joint management of the border, and use that term a number of times here. I think as we go through as we go through this, one of the ways that we we've looked at this is to is to uh, step back and say, you know, at times we're inspecting for immigration or customs purposes, or agricultural purposes on, on our own side of the border. It may not physically make very much sense. And you think of choke points like bridges in particular, um, where we cause a lot of congestion simply on, on the, uh, uh, across a bridge, for example, as, as the, biggest, uh, the biggest example of this. And so we've been looking at pre-inspection and pre-clearance. We define in the implementation port the difference between the two. Basically, pre-inspection is getting some of the 
inspection activity out of the way, whether it's for cargo, we do this for people um, in certain of our uh, certain of our ports. So we launched a we we um, launched a pilot out between British Columbia and the state of Washington last year to look physically at well, in this case, CBP coming over to the Canadian side. Um, would they be able to have the connectivity? Could the systems work so that the CBP officer sitting on Canadian soil could have access to all of the systems that she or he would normally have um, and do that cargo examination on a Canadian side? That pilot um, has been successful and will move on, as, you, as we'll talk about in a minute, to a next, to a next stage. Um, we talked further, uh, we, we continued our dialogue with, uh, with uh, business travelers through the year um, and uh, we think we've made some progress, although we have lots of progress, as I'm sure some of you would be happy to, uh, to witness. We have lots more progress that we need to make there. We've also been looking at, um, I talked about congestion. Sometimes we have congestion because one or the other, both sides have simply not kept up with traffic flows in terms of the physical infrastructure as well as the technological infrastructure. So as part of this, as part of the action plan, we committed to, for the first time, systematically plan together which border crossings uh, need more investment and which would be our priorities, which is the more important thing. We have stumbled at times over the years. One or the other side decide, is going to launch, launch forward with, uh, with an investment, investment program without really having alerted the partner on the other side. It's not very efficient. Uh, we, we, can, uh, we can do better. So we now, we had in 2013 the first, and there'll be another one this year, rolling five-year plans where we will publicly, publicly identify, we have publicly identified, our, our top priority crossings for investment purposes. This is planning. These are not commitments, and that's a tricky thing in budget processes in both our countries. Um, however, if we want to plan together, we need to be transparent uh, with each other. Other things that we can do um, in, in terms of moving legitimate travel through, uh, small, small low-value par parcels and, and shipments are almost always lower risk, um, so we have decided to, um, to give access to a materially larger uh, class of, uh, of shipments, of values. We both raised our dollar thresholds, harmonized them as well. Um, which, which, is, uh, which is both making faster and cheaper the uh, transmission of these, these uh, parcels, which has commercial benefit, it also has benefit to individual consumers. So as we move forward into where, where, what do we have remaining, this is, this is a three to five year action plan. Most of the commitments um, are, are to be delivered by this year. Some go into 2015 or even 2016. Um, as we look at our trusted traveler program, first of all, Nexus, we've committed to work together um, to add third countries um, and fourth countries and fifth and fifth countries. So that is, um, we are we are moving actively on that score. Um, the United States uh, has previously um, had other trusted traveler um, outreach uh, programs separate from us. So we want to bring that bring that together so that we can speed up the flow of legitimate folks through airports, allow, the, uh, allow those um, whose job it is to look for risky folks to focus uh, exactly on that. I talked about uh, pre-clearance and pre-inspection. So we will move, we will move that, that uh, pre-inspection pilot um, in a matter of weeks, um, a few weeks we hope, to Peace Bridge, which is between uh, Niagara Falls, New York, and Fort Erie, uh, Ontario. Um, so this will be a pilot where we will be specifically now testing, can we speed up cargo flow um, um, southbound uh, by putting CBP inspection in Canada and moving, the, moving those trucks through? We, we need to rigorously test, track, evaluate, um, and that will be, that'll be underway uh, shortly. We also, you'll note up there, we, we in, order to, in order to look at doing that permanently, we need to actually establish what in Canadian terms would be a treaty. We have a treaty between our, between our two countries for pre-clearance 
um, formally, so not just cargo inspection, but full people inspection. So when my colleagues and I flew down here yesterday, we met a CBP officer in the Ottawa airport and from the point of view of that officer said, welcome to the United States. So when we, we can fly into, uh, into Reagan National Airport and uh, we could have been coming on a plane from Pittsburgh, we are already cleared for entry into the U.S. We do that, CBP does that at eight Canadian airports. We need to establish all the formal protocols and authorities to be able to do that for individuals crossing on land uh, via ra uh, passenger rail or marine traffic. We have uh, cruise ships, we have ferries that move back and forth. Um, so, and, and of course we have 120 land, land crossings as well. So it's a major undertaking to make sure we have full appropriate um, uh, legal powers on both sides um, to move from these pilots potentially to um, actually establishing the authority to be able to do that where it would actually make good logistical sense, um, which is not every crossing, is not every airport, um, but uh, we're working, uh, working hard on that. Um, we also at, uh, mentioned there's 120 crossings. Many of those are very small local crossings. Um, and the, it's, it's uh, a constant issue as to whether or not those can, be, can remain open. Is there a business case for 30 crossings a day? So what, what we're looking at, um, and, and we'll be uh, on both, both governments um, by next year, we'll be piloting a technology-based approach to quote, staffing, um, operating those small and remote ports. There are 60 some of those ports between, between our, our two countries. They are very important to local communities. A hospital that serves communities on both sides needs to be accessible. Um, job opportunities, possibly a gas station, possibly a grocery store. Um, those are very important crossings to local communities um, and we're looking at jointly uh, can we jointly operate those? Can we use technology to be able to ensure that those crossings, uh, very important locally, uh, can continue? Coming back to coming back to uh, also in the traveler in the traveler domain, um, a few of our crossings, especially anybody who travels be on the west coast, um, we have some great technology up as you approach the border from uh, 50 miles back or 50 kilometers in Canada back, you can see digitally what the wait times are if you have a menu of three or four crossings. Uh, we're working to expand that across um, to from six locations to 20 locations uh, in the next step. Um, back into the commercial realm, um, something that is uh, critically important, it's a three to four to five year project, but you'll see single window up there. So uh, today, um, coming into a shipment coming into Canada uh, may need approval from up to 10 different departments in our government. As it turns out, electric refrigerators are the single, the single uh, worst example that we found, um, the, the various permits and approvals that are required. In the U.S. government, it's 10 to 20 or, or more um, agencies. So the various checks and approvals that are required um, by, for CBP to implement in, from the U.S. CBSA going into Canada um, is three quarters, 80 percent of those checks can be on behalf of other departments. Many of them are done on paper today. Many of them you have, you have to give the same information to different departments. So under single window, which is well advanced and we think in Canada should be up and running fully by the end of this year, the U.S. the end of next year, the start of 2016, one electronic application in to CBP or to CBSA will be spun around to all relevant departments. Um, digital digital uh, electronic decision making that's audited by people and one electronic answer back. It'll be faster, it'll be simpler, you give the same information to whomever needs it, you get one reliable answer back. This obviously requires um, uh, not just, not just um, system development and, and connectivity amongst our departments to go along with ACE in the U.S., E-Manifest in Canada. It also requires that the business-facing systems be updated, and it requires that the trade systems be updated to be able to accommodate this. 
but we're pretty confident that the uh, that the systems that trade is in any case putting in place um, to take advantage of and comply with. Um, ACE in the U.S. and E-Manifest as those are coming on stream, that this will also this this kind of uh, this kind of functionality will be usable by the trade and will also deliver great benefits and uh, will save save money and save time inside government and and outside. So in terms of, I think I've, go, I've gone through most of these, what we're getting at here is, is uh, jointly working together, making sure we can use information, uh, share our programs so that we can, as I said, speed up, um, speed up legitimate trade, legitimate travel, reduce time, reduce costs. Pillars three and four we've combined here. Cross-border law enforcement and critical infrastructure and cybersecurity are what we're about in these pillars. Fundamentally, um, if we come, come back again to identifying risks at or beyond the perimeter, working, working at trying to um, identify low-risk trade, low-risk travelers at the border, there are other aspects, though, if you consider it, that are required to jointly manage a border so that... Um, so that we can assure that that legitimate trade and legitimate travel can can move through quickly and reliable, reliably. Um, and now we're in the world. Now we're in the world of of thinking about well, what can go wrong at the what can go wrong at the border? Why else would we care? Well, obviously there are law enforcement issues um, that are not about national security, but are about malafide um, actions at or around the border. There are natural disasters. There's other kinds of other kinds of emergencies, um, uh, whether it whether it be a storm, a hurricane, uh, a break in a in a pipe, um, other sorts of things. So we have a, we have quite a large number of initiatives in this action plan that people are working on that really enhance our ability to predictably uh, work together on contingency planning. Um, in the realm of and in actual operations. So uh, just to highlight a couple of these, um, ship rider operations, what does that mean? It's actually, it's actually a fairly graphic description. Um, we have many, many parts of our, our shared border are actually imaginary lines drawn on waterways. Um, and traditionally, uh, traditionally uh, criminal elements and others have been able to uh, been able to escape enforcement by getting across that imaginary line. So we've dealt with that by developing this shipwriter program, which we agreed to in, 20, in 2012 and now is in operation, whereby we have jointly staffed um, uh, patrols and uh, interdiction operations um, on our waterways uh, with uh, able, legally authorized to operate on both sides under the law of whichever side of the border happens to be on under the operational command of whichever side of the border that that uh, border ship happens to be on but giving us a continuity of law enforcement and interdiction back and forth um, so this is this is when you when you look at the map um, you realize how critical this is to actually joint border management um, we have a um, working, as I said, on land border emergency and recovery, marine border emergency and recovery. And finally, the other aspect I <coughs> emphasize here is we'll talk about infrastructure, and we have already, but in the modern economy, modern society, digital infrastructure is critical, both to whether it's uh, you and your family, uh, uh, your kids uh, wanting to work on the internet or enjoy the internet, or whether it's e-commerce or whether it's almost any financial transaction, uh, digital infrastructure is key to today's world, which means cybersecurity is a critical requirement to, for the two governments to jointly work together, to jointly manage threats, and to jointly work with our private sectors. And so that's an important part of this plan. So last year, as I said, we actually uh, we've um, deployed permanent shiprider teams. We have surge operations. Um, 
on our on uh, on the west coast, Great Lakes uh, between Detroit and, uh, and and Windsor, Ontario, in the Atlantic regions. Um, police forces and law enforcement folks need to be able to talk to each other for regular operations back and forth, and also in emergency operations. Uh, we have a number of uh, a number of initiatives moving back and forth. We need to have a shared understanding of infrastructure and other sorts of uh, other sorts of uh, um, um, uh, installations that could pose uh, emergency threats or other kinds of threats back and forth across our border. So we're conducting what we're calling regional resilience assessment programs. Our are pieces of infrastructure resilient back and forth across our borders? Um, we've, do, we've completed one, Maine, New Brunswick, and we're moving that across, back and forth across the border. Where are we going this year? More ship rider teams, more of these shared waterways, taking the inter radio interoperability for law enforcement into additional, additional regions, moving that maritime resumption planning with uh, which uh, the Penwar Group, which many of you might know, Pacific Economic Northwest Region, um, pioneered on the, on, in the Pacific area. We're moving that into the Great Lakes and the Atlantic region. So I said in terms of actual and emerging benefits, um, in some ways this, I mean, this may, for the, if you come at it for the first time, saying, boy, this is a scattergun approach. Doing all kinds of things, there must be, you know, there's uh, 20, 20 parts of each of our government involved. But the unifying theme, again, is that we are looking at systematically trying to figure out how do we manage threats jointly, how do we speed up, identify um, who are the legitimate low-risk uh, travelers and trade, whether that's coming onto our shores from abroad or moving back and forth between our countries, and sharing information, uh, speeding up the use of information as well as technology and infrastructure and then systematically ensuring that we can manage the border on an ongoing basis in an operational sense and being robust to threats, uh, whether they come from human sources or they come from, uh, they come from natural, uh, uh, natural, uh, um, natural threats. Um, so while it is 32 initiatives that have, in fact, break down to like 60 or so individual, individual deliverables, those are the, the those are the um, uh, the kind of three buckets that uh, that they really fall in. So I'll pass it back to uh, Amy to wrap up our presentation. Um, so I just say finally that we recognize that um, um, although we're doing all of this bureaucratic work between our two governments, um, without uh, engaging with the public and holding ourselves accountable, um, it's it's. Uh, not as meaningful. And so, um, one, um, this year we've really committed ourselves to being more public facing um, and talking to folks about what we're doing, getting feedback on what's working, what's not working, uh, making sure people are aware of our commitment to um, the issues and, um, and, and, and getting graded on, on how we're doing. Uh, we do our own self-assessment um, when, we, when we publish the action plan um, in December of 2011, we committed to, um, on a yearly basis, um, looking at all of the objectives um, and accounting for the work that we had done and whether we had stayed on time and on task and, um, and identifying the direction we needed to go. And so um, for those of you who are interested in, in looking at um, some more detailed assessment, that's available on our, on our websites. Um, and I'll, I'll show those in just a minute. Um, but we just released a report in December of this year, which accounts for the 2013 work. Um, and uh, uh, David and his team have been um, taking on a new initiative this year, which is um, exciting for those of you who are interested in, in border issues. Um, they're publishing a newsletter really giving people more um, up-to-date and timely information of the direction we're going. Um, Likewise, we're coordinating with one another on um, information we're posting on our websites, on public releases, um, and, and again, looking for opportunities to engage with the public. So um, these are the ways that we've identified to, to hold ourselves accountable, to be as transparent as possible, um, and engage with interested stakeholders. Um, so we're very much looking forward to um, hearing from all of you as to what's working, what's not working, um, and just getting feedback on the direction we're going. 
So um, with that, this is where, for those of you who are um, following closely, you can get, um, I won't say minute to minute by minute updates, but um, certainly um, fairly timely information about the initiatives that, that we are committed to implementing. Well, thank you. <coughs> thank you. Sure. Thank you very much, uh, Amy and David. That was a very detailed and uh, directed uh, briefing, much appreciated, and a very important update. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if you agree, I will just uh, make a couple of very brief comments and pose a question as members of our audience are thinking of questions that they, they may have. Uh, one comment uh, I think would, uh, that has come to my attention uh, as I reviewed this material over time is that Canada and the United States are probably engaged in the most important mutual confidence building exercise that the two countries have ever experienced. And I go back to previous trade negotiations, whether that be NAFTA, whether that be the original Canada-US Free Trade Agreement. Those were particular uh, examples at the time, but far different from the detail and the depth and the breadth that uh, the implementation of this full program plan, including the RCC, uh, will affect, and, and in so many ways, uh, reaches down more personally into the lives of our respective citizens and has every uh, potential to improve uh, those lives in so many ways. So uh, wishing you and your teams obviously much more continued success in this area. Uh, you mentioned, each of you, the Border Infrastructure Investment Plan. You mentioned uh, infrastructure as uh, critical infrastructure as a uh, main priority of interest. Uh, we know, and you've made reference to how the plan is, is that. It's a list of what would be in our plans, but no commitments here. We know that in each country, the budgetary situation and process are different. Uh, in this country, we've just had the passage of the uh, very welcome, uh, long-awaited omnibus uh, bill for fiscal year 2014, which ends the end of September, for those of you who are on a different fiscal year. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, with that plan, for example, there was much creative language about um, P3 partnerships that were potential for infrastructure and other kinds of projects at border crossings. Uh, there was a provision for, I believe, 2,000 more um, CBP officers. Uh, we know that uh, the Congress will allocate and the Congress uh, appropriate and authorizes, but it's not up to the Congress to determine where those resources will go, nor up to the Congress to determine uh, what infrastructure will be built. Uh, together, as you've examined the value of having a plan uh, for infrastructure, uh, is there a mechanism that then get, uh, enables you to take that plan through your, obviously through your interdepartmental, interagency group, but then come face to face with appropriators and authorizers uh, to have a discussion on, here's what we would like to think would work, uh, and then see if you can't mesh it with their perspective on priorities. And at the end of it all, create a kind of one-stop shopping uh, for such efforts on either side of the border so that we don't have um, initiatives that then must go to GSA, to CBP, up the road to DOT, whatever the case may be. Uh, is there some thinking in that regard? Maybe there's a framework there that I'm not aware of. And I uh, wonder if you could comment on that, please. Well, so I, I will say I think this is one of the advantages of having this um, initiative and the action plan um, at the level of um, the White House and the Privy Council office because we're able to bring a level of coordination to um, things like infrastructure planning but also appropriations. So um, in addition to the coordination that we're doing internally across DOT and DHS and um, GSA and all the other players, um, we're also um, coordinating very closely with, with OMB, which is part of, part of the Executive Office of the President, so that when we are going to appropriators, um, the, the messages that are going to them are reflective of our consensus internally. So on our side, we do have that kind of uh, mechanism just through our coordination. Um, obviously, Congress has its own prerogative and own priorities, and so we, we are um, ultimately 
deferring to them, but we are trying to educate them about the direction that, that we have um, chosen to go and make sure that that's um, um, consistent across the board. Okay. Uh, from the Thank point you. of view of Canada, um, I guess I would say that, that um, the, uh, the, uh, having a border, a border um, infrastructure investment plan is helpful um, in terms of, um, you know, from the point of view of the government and the parliament as they're, as they're making budgetary allocations to be sure that, um, that a, a particular proposal that might come forward from a department or a minister that it makes sense in the large, that it makes sense between the two countries, between, uh, between the two economies. So in the plan, that in the, in the specifics that were released in December of 2011, Canada identified four particular crossings as our top priorities for investment, um, and they had been discussed with the U.S., and um, it, we're not agreeing with each other, we're coordinating, we're coordinating with each other. So at that, at that point in time, the government had not allocated funds, hadn't made that commitment. But since then, we have. So since then, these four crossings, one in, uh, uh, one in Quebec, one in Ontario, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan, the government has come out and committed and put a dollar value and a timeline on those investments, which add up to, um, it's north of $100 million dollars. Um, um, in either currency, um, so uh, those we have. It inf I would say the plan informed that that process. And uh, as a uh, the other side of the coin, if you will, uh, the priorities identified by the United States in the action plan have those as well had funds committed to them at Lewiston, for example, yes, and yeah, other Yes, yeah, they crossings. have been. Um, the priorities were not dependent on this year's um, appropriations. When we were looking at the priorities, we were looking at funding that would be available and where we'd be able to move forward. But um, I will say we are, you know, we, we are working closely with Congress because we do need their support and their, their um, it, they need to realize um, why this matters to their constituents as well. And so that's a, a big part of what we do. Excellent. Uh, one last question from, from me. Uh, you mentioned the success of the growth of the Nexus card program, and there probably are people here who are Nexus card holders. I suspect there are people here who are holders of something called the Global Entry Card. Mm -hmm. And I, as I understand it, I believe the Global Entry is not a card you can use for entering Canada, uh, but certainly under preclearance at Toronto or Montreal, you can use it to come back into the United States. Do you see a, an opportunity or do you envisage uh, the, the meshing of, if you will, the global entry and the Nexus card program, or at least an acceptance of both as equally valid uh, for entry to Canada, for example? Well, uh, I should let Amy talk about the, the, um, where the global entry program itself is going, but the, um, uh, the clear value, I think, of the Nexus card is that it is, it is um, uh, it, it allows it, it allows um, a uh, a particular designated lane accelerated access on uh, either land or air, um, and so and and now um, applying for Nexus as a Canadian at least automatically gives you global entry um, uh, membership membership as well. But the uh, the land as well as the there probably there's probably there traditionally has been much greater use in terms of land crossings. Than in terms of air passage, with some of the the uh, the improve or the extra benefits we've provided, now I think that's starting to even up. Good. Yeah, I, I I'm actually glad that you mentioned global entry and, and Nexus because this is um, I think one of the the most um, underused but really valuable benefits that are available to our our public. Um, we are you know through um, the leadership over at Customs and, and Border Protection and DHS. Um, they are really looking at ways to make the um, investment worthwhile. So Global Entry gives you Sentry and Nexus benefits. It now gives you um, TSA pre-check benefits. I mean, it's. Um, I think this is um, going to make a really meaningful difference. But we do need to get people um, involved in the program. So we recognize we need to do a better job of, of branding it and making sure that we're um, accessing all the benefits that are available. Um, but then we need folks to, to sign up. I became a member this year. I'm glad to say, so I'm, I'm already 
uh, very pleased with, with the way it works. That TSA pre-check is a huge benefit. Um, one question I would have then, because Air Canada is the only foreign airline flying out of Ronald Reagan Airport, um, is there any indication from the airlines that, that they are even able to offer in coordination or consultation with TSA for a TSA pre-check for anybody checking into Air Canada flying to Canada? Um, no, we've not had. We've, I mean, we've, we're putting we're putting parallel benefits in place in Canadian airports. I see. Um, open to everybody who's a, mem a member in the program. As a, it's not airline specific. It's it's program specific. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's uh, let's now open to other questions, please. I think people have had an opportunity to uh, give some thought to, and we have colleagues with microphones here to assist. Gentleman down here, Andrew. Please. Thank you. Good morning, and uh, thanks for being here today. Appreciate the update on the uh, Be Order Beyond the Border Action Plan initiatives. Um, my name is Chris Bidwell. I'm with Airports Council International in North America, and I, I just first have to really applaud you for reaching agreement on the mutual recognition of cargo programs. This is something that helps to preserve the efficiency that is so critical to that business. But I'm really curious to just to drill down a little bit. And one of my questions you actually touched on, Paul, which was the expansion of benefits similar to what you get under pre-check to Canadian Nexus card holders or global entry members for individuals departing Canadian airports. Right. And I think there's a pilot program, but just encourage you to expand that to, to other locations. But um, one of the other things that, that our members b on both sides of the border actually have been uh, curious about is, and, and Amy, you touched on in your slides, is the deployment of explosive detection systems right. at Canadian airports. I'm just curious, is that on track to meet the 2015 deadline that was identified in the plan? Right, okay. Um, well, maybe I'll start uh, just three quick points there. First of all, in terms of the cargo, recognizing the, the cargo s screening. For those who don't know, basically TSA and Transport Canada audited each, each other's systems and determined they didn't need to rescreen on landing cargo that had been screened on the way out by the, by the, the competent regulator on, in the other side. Uh, secondly, in terms of there, w uh, in, there has just been a pilot launched in Toronto uh, at the uh, Pearson International Airport to um, offer a pre-check style not just separate lane, we already have that, going the next step to, um, to less intrusive sort of screening. Um, and so that, that's a pilot um, to assess moving that then across the border, across the, across the country. Um, what's also moving across the country, um, as you mentioned, the explosive, um, uh, the eight pre-clearance airports um, are in the course of moving to the same level of explosive detection uh, systems um, for baggage, passenger baggage screening, um, we we are we are part way through. We are careful to not say which airports um, have it in place um, because it'd be a security risk to uh, to identify the others. But uh, we believe we're on track and we're still pushing. We think we're going to we will make that uh, that 2015 target. My name is uh, Dave Jones. I'm a retired U.S. Foreign Service officer. Uh, thank you indeed for uh, coming uh, to uh, Washington on what would be a mild uh, spring morning uh, in Ottawa. Not quite. <laughs> uh, my question is uh, posed in a sort of general way, uh, admitting that uh, across the border uh, exercises like marriages will never be fully completed and are an ongoing process. Can you give us any ch any? concept of the percentage of what you have been able to complete so far, either pick a specific program or go across the board, but because what you have been saying is pilot program here, partial presentation there, uh, say expectation that Nexus is going to rise, etc. But an overall generalization might give us a concept as to how you're doing. Thank you. 
Well, that's, that's, that, that's a good question. I'm probably not going to give you a satisfactory answer. I mean, I think it's, it's as you see, there's so many, they're, 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 really, they're really close to 60 individual lines of business. Some of them are fully complete. Um, some of them, you know, we give a gold star Nexus, Nexus uh, for example. We're clear in the, uh, we're clear in the, uh, the 2013 implementation report that we're somewhat behind the curve on the trusted trader. Uh, moving really materially moving forward in terms of of just understanding how we each approach those issues we've made some gains um, in terms of made some progress in terms of identifying and and uh, transplanting if you like best practices we have a lot more we have a lot more work to do there um, I think we're we the, the term that we settled on was meaningful progress across the board um, I'm glad you mentioned pilot projects because it's probably something that 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 um, that I I didn't um, pick up enough. Many many of the the most um, the most interesting for 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 wonks like me, exciting aspects of this plan is we're moving towards a transformational approach to how we work together. And the most transformational are, of course, the toughest things to do between between even two close partners as close as we are. So these pilot projects are specifically there to test and to learn. I mentioned explicitly in terms of the, uh, the pre-inspection uh, pre pilot that we're just launching in PeaceBridge. It's critical if we're going to do that that we have, to, we have to set the metrics ahead of time, then we have to track, and then we have to evaluate. Um, but then the, the, these specific deliverables are set out, um, the, the kind of enumerated deliverables that are there are set out really as first steps. And um, if you read the kind of headline commitments, they're quite a bit broader, quite a bit farther reaching than the specific get this pilot done. So their um, um, Im implicit um, in a way, um, implicit certainly specifically, but explicit generally, there's quite a bit of work to do to take these pilot projects and then to figure out what next. Do we move to a broader set of pilots? When do we go to scale? individually across these. So this really is a long-term new relationship um, that we're talking about. Um, I'll, I'll leave you to set the legal, the legal uh, term of that. Amy, I'm sure you want yeah, to speak. So I would, I would add, um, we can, um, if you take a look at the implementation reports that we put out on a yearly basis, it'll give you some granularity. Um, but on the subject of um, the pilots becoming permanent or whether for they become permanent, I think what we've realized um, is that in some cases the pilots um, give us information that suggests that what we were doing or what we thought would work um, doesn't actually work or is not the best practice. So a great example of that is the pre-inspection pilot that we were doing um, in Blaine, Washington in Surrey um, where we realized that the, the pilot program was not actually the fastest way to move traffic. And um, this was really um, a, uh, a tribute to CBP and their assessment of what was going on at the border. But that the better practice was actually to actively manage the lanes and be able to switch on and switch off different lanes depending on the traffic flows. So that's the kind of information that's really valuable to us. And what we take away from that is, okay, we're not going to expand pre-inspection at um, that particular location. Um, that location we need to use another tool. So um, that's the value of this and, and that's where I think um, it takes us, we really need to have to be open to that kind of evidence and figure out what is the best, um, the best practice for, for our public. Thank you very much for being here today. This was very informative. I'm Jeff Biggs with the American Political Science Association. For 60 years, we've had a parliamentary exchange between our congressional fellows and the Canadian House of Commons parliamentary interns. So we regularly have briefings not unlike this on both sides of the border. Both of you have, or all three of you, have mentioned distinction several times between plans versus commitments and coordinating versus agreeing. Now, I take it this is more than a semantic distinction. What is the real import of those distinctions? Well, I'll start. When I use the word command, I use the word in terms of infrastructure. So um, our, our, planning, our planning in terms of infrastructure projects, um, what are the things we're looking at that we're evaluating 
it would make a lot of sense since since every one of these crossings has two doors on it, two uh, two uh, two ends to the door, if you like. We should talk to each other. In our in our government, um, when a, 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 a minister of the government or the prime minister stands up and says, "We are going to do spend this money at this place," um, and that is a commitment that has that is rooted in a financial. A, a, a fiscal decision, if you like, um, and we have the authority to move ahead. Um, so that's, I think that's our decision. Uh, that's that's our distinction. And coordinating it would be it would be similar. It's as we are acting, um, do we do it alone in kind of parallel play, or can we actually do better if we uh, if we talk to each other as we're acting? I'd say that, um, um, and this is sort of personally my my biggest lesson learned is that. Um, although we actually share quite a bit in common, and, and um, um, our two countries probably have more in common than, than anyone else in the world, um, there are pretty very meaningful differences um, and that um, uh, in terms of what are the requirements, what are our statutory requirements, what are the expectations, what are the authorities um, of our various departments and agencies as they carry out their border missions. And so um, there are times just out of respect for one another's sovereignty where the best we can do is to say these are the standards, these are our requirements, and Canada likewise has their set of standards and requirements, and where can we harmonize those, where can we coordinate, but without ceding um, our, our sovereignty or our responsibilities um, um, or our statutory mandates. And so that's why we're careful to use that language. We are looking wherever we can harmonize and bring our standards up to a place um, that is that is compatible. Um, that's our goal. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Amy and uh, David, on behalf of those who have uh, come here this morning. Uh, you've provided us with uh, an ongoing uh, appreciation of the work in hand and also a, a real sense of the progress that has been made. Thank you for taking the time today, and we wish you continued success in your efforts. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you all for yes. attending. Well, thank you all.